And then, chapter four started the applications of the intersection theory, intersection number. Broadly speaking, we discussed two classes of applications. Number one, chapter four, to maps, mappings. Number two, chapter five, to vector fields or dynamical systems, mappings and dynamical systems. I'd like to um, tell you that there are many, many other applications. Um, I think at this um, level and in this style, we could have gone on discussing a huge variety of applications, how you use the machinery of intersection theory and some other allied concepts for perhaps another three weeks. I can double the amount. But because we had the limitation of time, we stopped these and I tried to select uh, an interesting enough variety. But there are many, many more things you could do in principle if you have a little extra time. So for number four, the chapter four, we discussed the fixed point theory, fixed point theorems. I say theorems in plural because there were uh, different versions. The key to applying topology or intersection theory to the study of fixed points was to think of the mapping as a graph. You take the product of the manifold with itself and you draw the graph of that mapping that you're considering. Graph. At the same time, you have to consider the diagonal of this product, which is noted by delta. And you notice that the in intersection points of the graph and the diagonal diagonal of the graph were none other than the fixed points of this mapping. That was the interpretation. And you also remember that finding fixed points is a very important procedure because, for example, solution of any equation, be it algebraic, differential, what have you, was reducible to finding fixed points. Okay, so from now on, whenever you want to solve any equation, any equation, there is one way of looking at it. There are many other ways, of course, but uh, an additional way to look at it is to think in terms of fixed points. Good. So, the famous concept here was that of Lefschetz number after Solomon Lefschetz. By the way, Lefschetz was a mathematician in the, very active in the first half of the 20th century and a little later, of Russian origin. He came from Russia, went to Paris, and became an engineer in Paris. Unfortunately, while he was a young engineer, a laboratory accident uh, took place. An explosion blew off both his hands. Really terrible incident. So he lost his hands, literally. He couldn't become, be an engineer anymore. So he studied mathematics and became one of the leading, most influential mathematicians of the 20th century. Uh, that's it. He later emigrated to the United States and spent most of his career at Princeton. Um, that's just number. And this was denoted by the funny symbol which looks like somebody walking, lambda, capital lambda of F. <laughs> is equal to the intersection of the diagonal with the graph of <coughs> this map f. Okay. And if this number is non-zero, that means that, well, in particular, there must be intersection points inter contributing plus or minus one. So there must be fixed points. That was the logic. The theorem which is called Lefschetz fixed point theorem, is almost therefore a tautology. Tautology means that saying exactly what the definition is saying, that if the Lefschetz number of a map is non-zero, it implies that the map must have fixed points. As it stands, this theorem would not be very useful because you know, by now I hope you are sufficiently prepared in pictorial thinking that it's saying the same thing. 
But the power of this map, power of this map comes from the previous theorem, theorem 17 of the previous chapter, that when you calculate the Lefschetz number, you see it's the intersection number, in fact. And the intersection number is invariant under isotopy. So if you want to find the Lefschetz number, or if you want to find the fixed point of some map, as far as the number of fixed points is concerned, you don't have to use the original map. You can deform the original map to something much simpler and count the Lefschetz number for something much simpler. And then you know that that number is the number, Lefschetz number for the original map. A very beautiful instance of deforming a problem to something simpler and solving the problem in the simpler version. Okay? And as a consequence, we can find fixed points in case you want to calculate the Lefschetz number for a map that is given in terms of formulas. Yeah? Often in applied contexts, applied situations, you have to calculate the Lefschetz number, but from a formula definition of, um, of the map, there was a formula. And it was that you take the sum over all the fixed points, so x fixed point of f, of the, you calculate the derivative of your map. In general, it is the Jacobian at x. It's an m by m matrix. Subtract the identity map. It looks a bit like the uh, characteristic polynomial, and there is a relationship. And then you take the determinant and look at the sign. And that sign plus or minus corresponds exactly to plus or minus signs of the intersections. This formula, although it looks very impressive, is quite difficult to use. But we have used it in some simple situations. And then, as a direct corollary of Lefschetz, we had the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Perhaps this is historically the um, most famous of the fixed point theorems, and it is one that was used most often outside mathematics, in applications in mathematics. But you should realize that this is a direct con consequence of Lefschetz. Having said it's a direct consequence, Brouwer says that if you have a continuous map from a ball to itself, it has a fixed point. No further assumptions. Continuous map, any continuous map from a ball to itself, fixed point. A ball has a boundary. Lefschetz applies, of course, to manifolds without boundary. So we have to have a little trick to reduce Brouwer, deduce Brouwer from left sheds, and that trick, I still remember, we drew some pictures there, consists of projection, stirring, and embedding. Nonetheless, for all that, Brouwer is the direct consequence of left sheds, and we had many, many applications afterwards. Applications to, to the ergodic theorem, so if you like, this is a statistical equilibrium in the Markov chain. So application probability or statistical physics. And we also mentioned, we did not quite explain, but Nash equilibrium in game theory or eco economics. And you also remember the rather facetious discussion about stirring coffee or dropping a map and so on. Applications are nearly endless. Okay. And then the final chapter was an application this time moving from maps to vector fields or dynamical systems. Equilibria um, of vector fields. Yeah. In a way, fixed point theorems are concerned with maps, in other words, sort of global behavior, a topological behavior of some movement, whereas vector fields are local movement. So this is global application, local application of um, intersection theory, if you like. A somewhat intriguing and tricky concept 
certainly tricky to visualize, but the concept of tangent bundle. That was a little difficult. You had to think of the tangent spaces as vertical. That was the only way to draw the picture, but we did anyway. And here, the way to think about the application is as follows. The tangent bundle was drawn like this, and the base manifold M was drawn like this. And there is a zero section, which is identified with the base. And what is a vector field? Well, a vector field looks like this. Hmm? And that's the gamma, the graph of the vector field. Where the two, the zero section and the gamma of V intersect, are none other than the zeros of the vector field that is equilibrium. You might remember these two pictures like this. You see, in the fixed point case, you are intersecting the graph by something that's tilted 45 degrees. Here, in the case of equilibrium vector fields, you are intersecting graph with something that's flat, zero degree. But that's the only difference. You just lift it like this or project it like this, and the idea is the same. It's always thinking in terms of the intersections, thinking in terms of simplifying the picture by deformation. And so, in this case, we had the concept of index of a vector field. It was simply plus or minus of the intersection signs. And index of a vector field could be calculated in principle. And if we had to calculate it in terms of a formula, that was the formula, it's a summation over all equilibria of V, of the given vector field. And if you sum the index of V at x, what did you get? Well, you got precisely, the picture makes it abundantly clear, the intersection number of the zero section and the graph of the vector field or the section of the vector field, as we say in professional terms. And then, sometimes, just as in the case of reference number, you might have to calculate the index from a formula. Sometimes the vector field or dynamical system is already given by a formula in applied context, practical situations. Well, you should know that, in principle, if you had a large sheet of paper and a clear mind, and a cup of coffee, you can calculate everything. And the calculation formula is that the index of V at X, remember that this is a vector field and this is a point, is um, simply equal to, well, first, you calculate the derivative of V. As before, it is really the Jacobian, the M by M matrix of partial derivatives. And then you think that you're going to subtract the identity, but you don't. Here we subtract the identity because I was comparing the graph with this 45 degree thing. Here we are comparing the graph with a zero degree, a zero degree thing, so you subtract nothing, or you subtract zero. And you look at the determinant of this, and then you look at the sign, and that is the index of V at X. And then, in order to have a very beautiful series of non-trivial applications, we introduced the concept. First met in our exercise session of Euler characteristic, which we denoted by chi, the Greek letter chi. Okay. This was simply the following. You just draw a suitable, reasonable network on your manifold. You divide, partition your manifold into a network. You can think of the example of the 2D. You have a surface, you have vertices, edges, faces, and you draw a network. If you like, a map of countries. And the order characteristic was beta 0 minus beta 1 plus beta 2 minus beta 3 plus minus plus minus plus in front of all the even dimensions minus in front of odd dimensions this alternating sum, alternating sum of the numbers of cells in all dimensions. And that turns out to be the Euler characteristic. This is a combinatorial definition, combinatorial in that 
you know, you draw a graph and some say they are complex and then you count. But it is, it turns out, it's not clear from the definition, but it turns out to be a topological concept. It does not depend on how you partitioned, what kind of, um, what kind of network you took. And then, I'm sorry, I'm going to overflow <laughs> to the third blackboard. Um, the main theorem of this chapter was the beautiful and powerful theorem due to Poincaré and Hopf. <coughs> Poincaré-Hopf theorem, which is parallel to the left sets fixed, um, fixed point theorem. It says, but it has a slightly different flavor, that if you take the sum of all the indices, well, we already know what that is. It is the intersection number between the zero section and the graph of your um, vector field. But you can say even more. It turns out to be the Euler characteristic of the manifold. You recall that this can be used, this great theorem can be used in two di different directions. Well, it's a single theorem, so how we use it is up to us, up to our psychology, up to our practical needs. You can imagine that you know something about the left-hand side, let's say, that you have a picture of a vector field or dynamical system or water flow, you remember that example, so that you can calculate all the indices. That knowledge of dynamical system tells you something about the Euler characteristic of the manifold. In other words, dynamical system gives you information about topology. Or you can go in the other direction. If you happen to know the Euler characteristic of the manifold, and that's very easy to calculate, you remember? You just partition and, and compute. If you know something about the Euler characteristic, well, that means that the sum of indices cannot be arbitrary it puts a constraint on the kind of dynamical systems you can have. Yes. So topology gave you information about dynamical systems. This kind of connection between two so-called different areas of mathematics is very typical. It's so typical, in fact, that you should be aware of the following fact. You know, when you go around the world and people, colleagues and others meet you, they often ask, what's your field? You might say, well, I do mathematics of sorts. And then they ask, oh, what area of mathematics? But that question is a little strange if you think about it. It's like saying, what do you eat? I say, well, I eat lots of things. So you specialize in meat, yes? <laughs> you never eat vegetables or fish or fruits and and they say, no, no, I, I also eat fish and rice and vegetables and fruits and so on. And they say, oh, you are such a multidisciplinary person. Well, I mean, mathematics, science in broad terms, and nature itself doesn't know that we are making all those strange distinctions and partitioning the science into little compartments, which are called courses. Okay. At schools and universities, for convenience, maybe we choose to devote a whole semester to differential equations. We may choose to devote a whole semester to algebra, whole term to discussion topology and so on. But that does not mean, that's just a convenience. That doesn't mean that the science is divided and those connections are all over the place. So please explore those connections. And indeed, it's by exploring those connections that you can solve interesting problems, new problems. If you are stuck in one field, you are likely to make some contributions, but those contributions will be textbook contributions. Yeah? Because the tools were prepared for exactly those problems, so nobody will be surprised if you solve problems using the tools that were designed for those problems. But using connections like this, you can apply tools from one field to another field, so you can find surprising results, which is what we want, what we, what we want to look for in life. Then, the simplest corollary of this was the fact that the number of equilibria of a vector field or dynamical system that you can draw in the manifold. Please remember that this is a generic situation. 
not degenerate. If it's degenerate, you have to shake the picture of any um, of any vector field on the manifold M is bounded below the useful bound by the Euler characteristic, but even the absolute value of the Euler characteristic. In particular, if the Euler characteristic is non-zero, you cannot have a vector field with, um, without singularity. Or, in other words, if the Euler characteristic is zero, every vector field, every dynamical system on that manifold must have equilibria, must have points where the vector field vanishes, must have singularities, as some people say. So, applications, again, in the uh, similar vein to applications that we had for left sets, we had the impossibility of forming a hedgehog. Existence of singularities for metrics in general relativity and so on. And as a dessert, as an appendix, we discussed. Just one more result, which can be approached by the topological or pictorial idea, which is the fundamental, so-called fundamental theorem of algebra. You realize that although that's the traditional name, everyone calls it fundamental theorem of algebra, it's actually not quite a theorem of algebra. Its real nature is topological. It has to do with winding numbers. It has to do with degree or some uh, intersection theory background. But anyway, it says that every complex polynomial has at least one root. And from that, you can deduce that it has in fact, as many as the degree of the polynomial, as many roots as the degree of the polynomial, and that can be deduced by a very nice topological argument. Is the whole picture clear? What we have done then is to look at many, many pictures and many examples. That's how we started. And then we introduced the concept of deformation. It's called isotopy. Deformation of those pictures, deformation of situations, deformation of your problems. Deform to something simple, solve the simple problem, and come back. And the intersection number was the invariant that we looked at. The intersection number is fortunately inv invariant under deformation. And then we discussed two classes of applications, fixed points and equilibria of vector fields. In the fixed point theorem, the main result was left sets fixed point theorem. And in the equilibrium of excuse me, in the equilibrium of vector fields, the main result is Poincare Hopf. That's the summary of the entire course as given at the Ames. And one anecdote about oh one addition about Lefschetz. I told you who Lefschetz was, this courageous man, and very interesting personality, in fact. You might want to Google him and read about him on Wikipedia or something like that. Um, you are related to Lefschetz. The reason is Lefschetz um, migrated to America and became a professor at Princeton. And he trained uh, quite a lot of good mathematicians at Princeton. And one of his students was called Steenrod. And Steenrod became a leading um, geometer, topologist of the age. He was at Princeton. He died relatively young. And Steenrod had many students, and one of them was called John Moore. And again, Moore was a great specialist in homotopy theory and a very imaginative mathematician. Again, a peculiar character, but, uh, but a great mathematician. And Moore had a student, uh, William Browder. Browder 
was really the greatest figure in the period of golden age of topology and geometry in the 1960s and 70s. I'm starting a little bit earlier, but 60s and 70s, and he constructed the theory of surgery. We discussed surgery, but that was for dimension two. It turns out that you can do the same thing in all dimensions, and you might remember uh, mentioning the Poincaré conjecture. You remember? So Poincaré conjecture, very famous event um, that was solved, was um, concerned with three-dimensional manifolds. But in that connection, you might remember I, my mentioning that, well, classification of manifolds is a very difficult problem. It turns out, however, that in dimension five and above, up to something called homotopy, you can classify manifolds which is quite surprising and amazing um, theory. Huge body of work. And Brauda, uh, not Brauda, by the way, Brauda, another Brauda, um, was responsible, was one of the chief architects, together with Novikov and Sullivan and others. Sullivan was a student of Brauda's of that development surgery theory on dimensions. And you are connected to Lefschet because when I did my PhD at Princeton, I was officially a student of Brauda's. And I now came to share um, picture drawing wisdom with you. So you descend from left by a long, <laughs> a long time. OK, let's take a break. Well done. And at 9.30 sharp, please come back. You can come back a little earlier if you like. But 9.30 sharp, probably 10 minutes will be enough for people to have a, a little tournament in ping pong. And, uh, but at 9.30, I'll show you something interesting. Yes, but, uh, you have told us uh, Lefschetz. Uh, 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 let's pronounce it. Yeah. Lefschetz. Uh, you uh, He has lost his two hands. Is it possible to uh, guess, to deal with mathematics without having hands? Ah. <laughs> so, Fikre's question, and please allow us one or two minutes, um, because that's an interesting question. I'd like to address in public in front of you. Fikre's question is Lefschetz lost both his hands as a young man. Terrible, terrible situation. Is it possible to do mathematics without hands? Well, clearly, yes, because he left a, a very important legacy in mathematics, very influential mathematician, uh, wonderful results and wonderful um, perspective. But there have been examples like this in mathematics. You see, there are people who didn't have hands, who did mathematics, and at the highest level, very creative. Another example from the area of topology and geometry is that of Pontryagin. Pontryagin, a Russian mathematician, was totally blind from, not from birth, but from very early childhood, from I think age seven or eight. Totally blind, but he turned, became one of the greatest geometers of the era. How can you do geometry when you don't see? Well, he was seeing an awful lot lots and lots of things that we, most of the rest of us, cannot see, but he was seeing them in his head. So, he could follow very, very intricate and very delicate and beautiful um, constructions and operations in higher dimensions and so on, in his, in his mind, totally blind, and yet um, mathematician of the first rank. There have been other examples of blind mathematicians. For example, a person that I know um, personally is uh, uh, somebody called Emmanuel Giroud at Lyon in France. He's a very tall mathematician and totally blind as well, but he's one of the leading geometers of our time. So you can see things. You, you can see things, you can do things, and you can overcome difficulties. And I happen to know that there are people also who go on to become really creative and leading scientists of the era, coming, back, coming from, say, war zones. There is an example in Vietnam. There are people who come from really poor backgrounds, really impoverished um, minimal conditions, and they yet, they have to have a lot of luck, but nonetheless they make it in science and they contribute to the advancement of knowledge. And there are people who come from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of cultures, all kinds of conditions, but with hard work, with help from others, and helping one another, and with a little bit of luck, you can often make it.